A, a quick reminder of something very significant and important as we open up the Gospel of Mark. And, and that would be the very first words that Jesus speaks in this Gospel. It's there in chapter 1, verse 15. The, the very first recorded works that Mark has for us as he pins this Gospel. And, and, he, and he says these words, Jesus speaking. The time is fulfilled... The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God. The, 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 I think the, the true meaning of that phrase is the reign of God, his rule, his authority, his kingdom. And not just those things, but a life lived under his rule. A life lived under his authority and his kingdom and his power and his mercy and his grace. And Jesus is proclaiming that that's not off in the future, that's not somewhere in the past, but it's, it's here now. He's arrived. And he begins to call. We saw Simon and Andrew and James and John. They, they leave their nets. They leave their vocation, their family business, so to speak, and they, they come under the kingdom, under the rule and authority of Jesus Christ. He goes into a synagogue into their hometown there in Capernaum, and Jesus opens the scriptures, he begins to teach, and you know the story, the people are like blown away, they're amazed, they're like, he's teaching with authority like we've never heard before. And, and in the midst of that teaching, there, there's a man who, who begins to cry out who's demon-possessed, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he's kind of pointing Jesus out. We know who you are. Have you come to destroy us? And with great power and authority, because the kingdom has come, Jesus cast out this demon. The kingdom of God has come, and he begins to call people to himself. He begins to take authority over demons. He, he heals sicknesses. Uh, he goes into Peter's home, and his mother-in-law is there sick, and Jesus heals her. And, and then that afternoon, when the Sabbath ends, people are free to come. They all line up in front of the door of Peter's house. And, and it, the Bible says here in the Gospel of Mark that he, he heals them all. The kingdom has come, calling people to follow, casting out demons, healing the sick. And Jesus is beginning to reveal his authority, who he is. He, he takes authority over leprosy. We saw that. He touches this man, and the kingdom of God is being demonstrated in all different ways. He heals a paralytic that's let down through the roof. And then he does something that really gains the attention of the religious authorities in his area as he heals this paralytic. He says his sins are forgiven. And now they're all uptight. They, they, they've rocked, so to speak, the theology of the Pharisees. And they're like, wait a minute now, healing okay, casting out demons probably all right. But saying you can forgive sins? No one can forgive sins but God himself. And Jesus is declaring that the kingdom of God has come. And here in chapter 2, it's starting to be resisted. And opposition begins to rise. Jesus has come in all his power and all his authority and I would submit to you that almost instantly it begins to be revealed to all those around. And it's shaking up the town. It's shaking up the religious system, so to speak. And now as we see today in our, in our passage, and we'll begin in verse 13, he calls another disciple. And they have trouble with this guy. They're, they're in verse 13 of chapter 2 here in the Gospel of Mark. And he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, which we would also call Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. Now, now if there was a contest in Capernaum to choose the most hated Jew around, 
Levi, well, he would win hands down. He was a tax collector. He's known to us once again as Matthew. He would sit at the toll gate there in Capernaum and people passing from the north, south, east, and west. He would tax the fishing industry there. And here's the thing about a tax collector. There, there's no posted tax rates. Levi could check your cart or he could check your sacks or check whatever you're bringing through the border there into the city. And he could look them over and then he would just give you a price. And he had the Roman soldiers there on his side to make sure that you obeyed, to make sure that you paid your tax. He would sit there, and, 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 and he, he had this function as a tax collector working for, for Rome, but he was a Jew. And he was despised not only by the Jews, but also by the Roman government, even though he's one of their official tax collectors because they saw him as a traitor to his own people. He had a quota to raise, but the profit he got above that through cheating and intimidating and bribery, well... He kept for himself. That's how he made his money. He most likely lived in luxury and wealth. But his only friends, his only associates, would be other hated tax collectors and people like himself. No family member, no other Jew or Roman would have anything to do socially with the tax collector. So the question's this. Why would Jesus call Levi. Why would he call Matthew? Well, one of the top number one reasons is this. Jesus specializes in rejects. I mean, look around. <laughs> right? He specializes in them. That's who he calls. He, he, he goes after them. Simon, Andrew, James, John. See, they have family. They have jobs that are respected in the community. If following Jesus doesn't work out for them, they can most likely go back, back to their home, back to their fishing business. But once Levi breaks contract with the Romans, hey, he's done. He's got nowhere to go back to. And Jesus has big plans for Levi. And I would submit that Jesus has plans for everybody. That's why he called you to himself. That, that's why he came to you as, as the one who, who brings the kingdom of God or the rule or authority into your life. I'll never forget when I first got saved. You've probably heard this story. I, I, I was really shy at that time in my life, and I was attending a new believers class at this church, and they were having all of us new Christians share our testimony each Sunday about 10 minutes. And my turn was coming up. And I didn't go to class. In fact, I never went back to that class. Because I thought, I can't get up in front of those people and share my testimony. And, and the Sunday school teacher sent me a card. And on the card it says, John, we are missing you in our class. I know God has a great plan for your life. And I read that as a new Christian, as someone who was just starting to read the Bible and sense that God was changing my life. And I, I thought, God has a plan for my life? No one ever told me that. And I asked the pastor, I showed him the card. I said, look, look, th this says God has a, is this true? He goes, yeah, John. God wouldn't have called you if he didn't have a plan for your life. And God has a plan for everyone's life. He had a plan for Matthew, this, this ostracized tax collector that nobody wanted anything to do with. Not, not only was he going to call him to be one of his disciples, but he was going to write a gospel. In a way that probably no one else could write it. Because he had an a, a, a understanding of Roman culture like a lot of Jews did it. And he also understand the power of the kingdom of God. And he presented Jesus in his gospel as a king. And a picture of the kingdom of God that, that Mark and Luke could not quite contribute, but Matthew could. 
And God has called you into neighborhoods, into jobs, into situations, into families, to, to be a person, to be a witness, to be under his authority in a way that no one else could do except for you in the way and place and the personality that he's created in you. So he's called Levi. He's got a plan for his life. And it says, he arose and he followed him in verse 14. And it happened as he was dining at Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many and they followed him. So now Jesus has got a whole group of these guys. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, verse 16, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. I guess Levi, he's left his job and is kind of throwing a retirement party. And all his friends are coming. All the other tax collectors, all, all, all the other uh, people who are in the business like him. And so Jesus moves from one hated man to a whole group of them now. And look what they call these guys, the, the, the Pharisees. They said that when the scribes and the Pharisees, verse 16, saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners. They said, not only are they tax collectors, but they're, they're sinners, social and spiritual outcasts. That's how they see them. They sold out to the Romans. They don't follow the Jewish religious system. Now, not only are they sinners, but they're socially outcasts. And one tax collector is one thing, but now Jesus is hanging out with a whole house full of these people. So the Pharisees move in. And this is another, the beginning of, and you'll see this heat up all the way through the Gospel of Mark. This is opposition to the kingdom of God to his rule, to his authority, to his calling people to himself. Now, notice how they deal with the situation, these, these Pharisees. It's interesting. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw him, verse 16, eating with the tax collectors, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? They said to his disciples, not Jesus, they don't confront Jesus at this time. See, these are nice, holy, religious people, so they just talk behind Jesus' back. <laughs> to his disciples, hoping to plant a seed of doubt in their hearts. They're, they're backbiting Jesus is what they do. You know, it's like, how is it that your pastor hangs out with those people? Are you sure you want to go to his church? Do you want to follow that guy? I mean, this is what they're doing. See, I don't know if Jesus heard or if he discerned their hearts or the disciples told him what they said. Someone once said it takes two people to take you down. Your enemy to slander you and your friends to tell you about it. Jesus cites an old proverb. He responds when he, he knows what's going down. He, he, he understands and, and this is what he says. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, so Jesus agrees with these guys almost immediately. He goes, yeah, these guys are sick. They're really sick. You're right about them. They're sinners, they're, they're, they're publicans, you know, they, they, they need a doctor. But doctors hang out with sick people. Not because they like sickness. I don't think a lot of doctors like go to work and think, wow, I get to hang out with sick people today, right? But, but they go hang out with sick people because they want to heal sick people. And that's what Jesus has come to do. It's not like Jesus loves hanging out with sinners. Like, oh, I just love being around these lying, cheating, you know, traitorous people. You know, Jesus comes to change them, to, to, to bring healing to their sickness. 
See, it makes as much sense for Jesus and you and I to stay away from sinners as it does a doctor to stay away from sick people because the motive is not to become like them, but to help change them. Sinners and sick people both need healing. And Jesus says, well, you guys are so righteous, and that's what they thought they were. Hey, you don't need me, Jesus says. But these guys are so sick, they need me. And this is a situation a lot of times with people, they, they think, well, I don't need to be saved, or I don't need Jesus, or, you know, I'm not that bad, I'm a pretty good person, I've never done anything that wrong. And they cut themselves off from really ever experiencing the kingdom of God, the, the, the purpose of God in their life, and the, the ability to, to experience true change and have his authority in their life. And so the Pharisees kind of, they're, they're just shut down. Well, yeah, we are pretty good people. Yeah, you're right. We don't need a doctor. Kind of like Satan in the wilderness, he just kind of backs off. And Jesus is revealing the kingdom of God. See, he's come for everybody. All classes. All strata of life. And he gives hope for everyone. Some people truly think they're not sinners. Oh, I'm not like those people who have, need a crutch, who need Jesus. And Jesus truly can't help self-righteous people who can't admit they have a need for a Savior. They, they block him off. So Jesus says, look, I came for those who are willing to admit I need help, willing to recognize that they, they, they need change in their lives. I, I have to recognize my need before I will come to Jesus. And so Jesus is in the midst of this revelation, this authority of the kingdom coming into people's lives. And there's those who resist it, and there's those who recognize very quickly how much they need it. Disciples, it says, of John, this is John the Baptist, verse 18, and of the Pharisees were fasting. So you got John the Baptist's disciples, you got the Pharisees' disciples, and verse 18 says they're fasting. And they came to him, to Jesus. Now, now they're confronting Jesus personally. Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not. So, so they're kind of turning up the heat. Now there's a face-to-face the -face confrontation. The opposition is watching. They're waiting. They're, they're picking apart Jesus' lifestyle, his men. They're, they're watching what they're doing socially. They're, they're, they're saying, you know, these guys aren't, aren't even fasting. And fasting is a legitimate spiritual principle. I mean, Jesus had just fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. It's not like Jesus was anti-fast. But according to the biblical law, the Jews are required to fast only one time a year, and that's on the Day of Atonement. But the Pharisees had, had overextended the law and demanded fasting at least two days a week. And here's what you would do if you were a Pharisee or a disciple of a Pharisee or one of John's disciples and you were fasting, and most likely John's disciples were fasting because John was imprisoned or at this time he had been beheaded, we don't know, but you would wipe your face out with this powder, and you would put on this robe over your robe that was cut up, and it would, it would look, you know, uh, all fringed out, and it would make you look sad, or it was a symbol of repentance or mourning. And so you would see these guys with their white out face and their ragged clothes, and you would know immediately, oh, they're, 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 they're fasting. They're obeying what the Pharisees say. They're mourning for John. And so they come to Jesus and say, why aren't your men, why aren't your disciples fasting? And so Jesus, Jesus responds to them here in Mark chapter 2, verse 19. He said, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. 
Jesus actually kind of quotes something that John the Baptist himself had said. And I, I put it up here on the screen. It's in John uh, chapter 3. They came to John. This is his disciples. And they said to him, Rabbi, calling John the Baptist their rabbi, he who was with you, speaking of Jesus, beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing. All are coming to him. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. And, and then, he, then he says this, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friends of the bridegroom who stands and hear him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He spoke of Jesus, John did, as the bridegroom. And he says, it's a time of joy. It's a time for me to decrease. And, and Jesus is using this, this same terminology of, of what John said about the bride and the bridegroom. See, after a Jewish wedding, very different from our weddings, the bride and the bridegroom don't run out of the church and everybody throw rice at them and then they take off for St. Simon's Island or wherever they're going. They, they don't make this exit. They, they spend a week celebrating and all the rules of fasting and all the legal things are suspended for that whole week while they're fasting. And, and, and John calls himself a friend of the bridegroom, so there's no need for fasting or mourning white faces or torn robes. Jesus, the kingdom of God is at hand, his rule, his authority, his joy. And I think Jesus is making a very simple, powerful, biblical statement. There's a time for fasting. There's a time for joy. There's a time for feasting. There's a time for sorrow. And the Pharisees, and Jesus is kind of saying th to this to them, if you will, you guys are spiritually neurotic. You're so absorbed by the law and legalism that you don't recognize the times and the seasons of life. The, the bridegroom's here. The, the kingdom of God, he said it as he, as he began, as me, the kingdom of God has come. And it can't be wrapped up in old religious systems. In fact, look what he says. He goes on. Have you not never read, verse 25, when David, what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and he gave some to those who were with him. He says, you know, guys, you're so hung up that, that you don't even recognize that the kingdom of God has come and it can't be wrapped in old religious forms and rites and rituals. He's trying to help them see. He says, no one sews a, a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and tears it. This new piece of cloth is the kingdom of God that's come, he says. Christ has begun his ministry. He stated it plainly there in chapter 1. And Christianity, the church will be born on the day of Pentecost. And the old garment of Judaism, its feasts, its rules, its holy days, its regulations, its ceremonies, its sacrifices, its rituals will be fulfilled in Christ. And he's trying to help them see that the kingdom of God is changing everything. And you can't sow Christianity onto Judaism. It'll never work. And so this is beginning to, well, this is beginning to shake these guys up. I mean, think about it. His teaching, his healings, I can forgive sins. I'm not fasting the way you fast. I mean, this is really dealing with their theology in a way no one has ever done before. And, and, and he says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins, verse 22, or else the new wine bursts these wineskins 
and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. Here's what he's saying. New life in Christ can't fit in the old law and rituals. It's too brittle. It's, it's, it's too rigid to hold the life and joy of the new believer. It's like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He said, look, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. All, all these old uh, rituals and, and the, all things become new. Jesus didn't come to make us better, but to make us new, to give us a new life. The kingdom of God has not come to make us all conform to Judaism under the authority of religious Pharisees, but to bring hope and healing and forgiveness and joy and life to all who would repent and believe. L listen to Jesus once again at the very beginning of his ministry. The time is fulfilled. It's here. And the kingdom of God is at hand. So repent. Leave your old life. And believe in Christ. Be under the loving care and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your old life. Trust, believe, and receive Christ and have new life. That, that's what Jesus is declaring. That's why Jesus came. And, and, and this confrontation will get heavier and, and, and more intense as, as they try to trap Jesus and prove that he's not who he says he is. And Jesus goes on. Now it happened, verse 23. These guys are like, like bloodhounds coming after Jesus. He, he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said, have you never read what David did when he was needed and hungry? And those who were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar and the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except the priest also give some to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And then he throws this out to them. Therefore, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And they're like, What? It's another controversy. It's another confrontation. I mean, it was perfectly okay what the disciples were doing, what they were practicing. A part of the law said it, it, that you could go through these grain fields as long as you didn't use a sickle or a scythe, as they called it, and cut it down. But if you were hungry, you could take a couple of heads of grain and you could thresh them in your hand and you could eat the wheat. But not on the Sabbath. That was the problem. It's not like they're stealing watermelons from a farmer. That's not what's going down. They could do this practice, but it's the Sabbath, and the Pharisees had a thousand restrictions built into this holy day. The Sabbath was originally a day of restoration, a day of rest, a time for recreation, a time, time for joy. But the Pharisees had come up with so many interpretations of what it meant to rest, what it meant to cease from work, that the Sabbath had become a nightmare for everybody. Well, one illustration would, would be this. Let's, stay, so let's say you had a little phlegm in your lungs. <coughs> and you needed to excise it, spit. Well, it was okay if you spit on a rock, but you couldn't spit in the sand because that would make mud. And mud was mortar, and that was used for work. So you couldn't spit on the sand in the Sabbath, but it's okay if you, if you could find a rock, you could spit on that. That's how crazy and intense, and that, those rules were multiplied about every single, how far you could walk, what you could eat, you couldn't burn a fire. Everything was considered work or rest, and the Pharisees had taken this down to minutia. And Jesus reminds everyone why the Sabbath was made, and how 
David was able to, to on, on, a, on a holy situation, take bread that was reserved for the priest because God was okay with it because he was hungry. And man's hunger meant more to God than this holy bread that was just reserved for the priest. And what he's saying is that sometimes these, these Sabbath rules are set aside for the good of man. Because Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. And, and he's trying to correct their theology that had become so strict and so religious that it no longer shared and demonstrated the mercy in the heart of God. And so Jesus proclaims his authority. And here, here listen, here, here's, here's Jesus coming on the scene. I have authority as I teach the word. I have authority over sickness. I have authority over sins. And now he says, I have authority over the Sabbath. The kingdom of God is at hand. Your true rest, my true rest, is not in a day. It's not in a Sunday or a Saturday, which was their Sabbath. But our true rest is in Christ. Not the seventh day of the week, which was their Sabbath. We rest in his completed work on the cross. After the cross, Jesus rose on the first day of the week, on a Sunday. Pentecost was on the first day of the week. And the church was born. And so the, the early Christians began to meet on the first day of the week. Because we find our true rest, not in keeping rules and regulations of the Sabbath, but we find our true rest in Jesus Christ. Amen? And, and what he did. Jesus would say it this way, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. You know what he was talking about when he said that? He was talking about all the rules and the regulations of the Pharisees that everyone was under all the time being criticized to minutiae. He says, all you who are, are weary and are heavy laden, come unto me. And what did he say? I will give you rest. I will give you a true Sabbath. Rest from religion. Rest from sin. Rest from your aloneness. Rest from the fear of death. Rest from, from not having a peace within. And he would say, it'll come through me. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus would say, the kingdom of God is at hand. And I would submit to you that he still does that today. To those who have no rest. To those who have no peace. To, to, to those like myself who one day said, does God truly have a plan for me? Yeah. And a rest. A rest from all your fears. A rest from, from a sense of no purpose in life. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus would say, it would go as far to say, either you're for me or you're against me. There's no middle ground. Well, I'm just kind of in the middle. I'm not for Jesus. I'm not, no, you're either for him or against him. And then he would also say, whosoever will may come. Doesn't matter how old, how young, how bad, how good, how early, how late. I stand at the door, he says, and I knock. If anyone will open the door, I'll come in. Yeah, but I tried that before. Well, you should try it again. Maybe you didn't do it right. Maybe you were just looking for a way out of some crisis situation instead of truly saying, I'm going to submit my life to the rule and authority because the kingdom of God has come. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was demonstrating to those who would listen. He was calling those who would follow. He was showing without a shadow of a doubt who he was. And yet there were those who were so caught in their own mindset and their own understanding of who God was and the way he could be approached and how you had to live in fear that they were unwilling to really open their eyes and see that the kingdom of God had truly come. And so the opposition is beginning to rise, and they're confronting Jesus. And Jesus is trying to, I think, very lovingly and very persuasively show them who he is. And he will do that in your life and in my life. And you know what? Even after you come to Christ, he continues to deal with those things in your life that need to be surrendered and submitted. I don't know about you, but while we were singing that song, Lord, make new wine. 
I'm thinking of all the things in my life right now. Yeah, Lord, that, that, that needs to change in me. Yeah, I do have a neighbor, Lord, that's driving me nuts. It's my wife. No, it's not my wife. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> but we all have issues. And there's this constant ongoing thing of being surrendered to the kingdom of God, of allowing myself to say, yeah, Lord, I, 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 I've kind of got, gotten back into that old habit or that old routine. There, there's that, that, that old saying, I'm sure you've heard it. I'm saved, but I'm being saved. And one day, I'll be completely saved. And that goes on for all of us. Now, if you're here today and you've never been saved, then I would say to you that the kingdom of God is at hand and he's knocking on the door of your heart and he said, if you'll open, I'll come in. But if you're too religious, if you're too good, then you will never hear the knock. But if you're willing to admit your need and the fact that, you know, I, I, I'm a publican, I'm a sinner, then, then, he's, then this doctor, this physician, this, this healer named Jesus will, will, will come in gladly and begin to restore. But if you're here and you're, you're kind of one of those people who, well, I got saved, but man, I've never really surrendered to the kingdom of God. Uh, I, I've sort of wanted him to follow me versus me follow him then he's still in the process of helping you, calling you. And one day, all of us will be completely saved. We'll go to heaven. And I don't know about you, but in the culture and crazy world we live in, I can say with great anticipation, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm not looking forward to the next election. I'm looking forward to the resurrection. Amen. Amen. <laughs>